afternoon. And thank you, thank you all for being here. Be an educator, I have to remind everybody, please, that if you have a cell phone, if you have a cell phone, could you turn it off? the wonderful man that you're going to celebrate today. I know that the family is delighted that you're all going to be here, and they thank you. And they have asked for a somewhat chronological tribute to Nick as we go through their addresses. Our speakers will simply follow each other and I will introduce the first speaker and then simply uh, fade away into the uh, sidelines until I have a few more words to say later. And the orders of the speakers will follow the program that you have. I think it would probably make sense for me to wait a few more minutes because lots of people are filing in. So as I said, the uh, speakers, I'll introduce Noel in a moment, and then all of the speakers will simply follow each other. And uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of all of the tributes, I'll uh, invite all of, all of you to come to Crooks Hall for a reception. So uh, without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Noel Prouse to say a few words. Noel. Yes, please. Noel. Scotland, 
um, and we brought a rugby team out here at the same time. And I can't remember if it was about Christmas '67, I think. Uh, we were on a five-match tour of British Columbia, so it was quite an experience for us. I, I'll whisper it to you, but the Scots won every match. <laughs>
David was rescued all and rebuilt it, and I felt that Nicholas was very much in the vanguard of that creation of David Mackenzie's vision of this school, and of course he became a very important part of it. Um, I was lucky enough, as I said, to come out at the beginning of his time here, um, and I saw it all emerging. Uh, and the famous occasion when we were both on the touchline up there, he on one side and me on the other, shouting at our team as we came in, shouting at each other as well. <laughs> There's no holes barred, it really was a battle to the end, both on and off the pitch. Um, and a great game it was too, and Anne Rees produced a very fine 15 that year, uh, which was certainly one of the best teams we played that year, whether it was in Scotland, or whether it was in British Columbia, or whether it was over in Vancouver. They were a magnificent team, and I shall always remember us playing against them. Unfortunately, after that, we <laughs> settled down, etc., 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 and I didn't come over again until the 2000s. Uh, and my goodness, how Brentford has changed uh, since then. So, I regard it as a great privilege to be the first speaker because I know how important Brentford and its students and his colleagues were to him and how much support they gave him during the whole of his time here. So thank you all very much for the role that you played in his very successful life here on the island. How's that? Great, okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, uh, Christine and I um, have been here on one or two, quite a few, not too many, not as many as we would like uh, occasions. And always we've seen Brentwood grow, we've seen Nicholas being um, so happy here, and we've seen and met many of his wonderful community who looked after him. Um, Quite by accident, when I was thinking about what to say today, I pulled out of my bookshelf um, a copy of Michael Young's 1958 book, The Rise of the Meritocracy, which had obviously belonged to Nicholas because it has his name in it and he'd written notes all over it. Um, by rereading it, I realized what a truly awful place Britain was in the 1950s um, and that how it was hardly surprising that he came here. Um, and um, uh, he, 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 in doing so, the kind of adventures that Noel described, he became, for me, a kind of hero big brother, um, a, 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 a kind of finder of new lands, a, an adventurer, um, teller of amazing tales. And I must have been only six and he 18 um, when we stood on an incredibly cold, bleak Southampton dock and said goodbye to an emigrant ship that was rusty and bound for New York. Um, and he, as Noel said, had been refused for national service because of his hand, which allowed him to be a fantastic cricketer, but not to pull on a rope. And actually, I think that was probably a good deal in the end. Um, and uh, he took off um, from cold, dark, ration book Britain. Um, as those 
who, of you who are taught by him will know much better than me. Um, Nicholas could tell a wonderful story. Um, as a teenager, I drank in his romantic tales of working on the Trans-Canada Highway where a moose charged a bulldozer. Uh, and on the now very controversial Trans Mountain Pipeline, which uh, uh, Noel mentioned. Um, maybe, it's, maybe we better not mention that bit. <laughs> um, and as he became more and more Canadian, those stories expanded to include the voyageurs, which completely entrapped me, um, paddling furiously south from Athabasca, First Nation traditions, the history and politics of what became his new identity, the West Coast. Um, and when he became a professional storyteller, alias history teacher, um, they expanded further and further into tales of, you know, what it, the feelings of a Soviet soldier in a tank at the Battle of Kursk in the Stalingrad campaign and beyond. And sometimes we in the family wondered a little bit how reliable all these stories were. <laughs> Um, but as we know, in these days of post-truth, it's not what's true that counts, it's what you want to be true. <laughs> um, after Cambridge, um, Nicholas returned to BC to teach at University School Victoria. Um, and I really wanted all his BC propaganda to be true, so much that in the late 60s, I came here as a landed immigrant. Um, i just left university. Um, Britain was in class war chaos. Uh, France was in revolt, revolt, and the Canadian Prime Minister was called Trudeau. Uh, <laughs> um, it reminds me so much today, of today that uh, before this trip, I actually found my old Canadian social security card and wondered if it still worked. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Nicholas was incredibly welcoming. <clears throat> By then, he was here, um, and he put me up in Ellis House um, and lent me his camper van um, which I very nearly drove into Campbell Lake on the way to try and find a job at Gulf River. Um, and uh, he eventually got me a job teaching at Kerry and Kixie Creek School in Vancouver, where I learned with a shock and very suddenly that I did not have his gifts for the profession. Um, fate led me away from Canada to Australia, but Nicholas's enthusiasm, inspiration, curiosity and adventurousness stayed with me. In my mother's eyes, he and I became the colonial brothers. I eventually decided to live in London, but my mother was always convinced that I would once again wing it for the Dominions, as Nicholas had. And Christine, my wife, and Franda struck up a sisterly solidarity based on my mother's incredulity that anybody would want to live outside southern England. <laughs> um, thanks to Nicholas, I still get shivers up my spine at the idea of the great Canadian landscape, the Fraser Canyon, another place where I nearly wrote off his vehicle and us. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, the Long Beach, the Barrest Ranch, where his friends the Chataways let us pretend to be all hat and horse, if no cattle. Um, and uh, Vale Mount, where his students came to school on snowshoes at 40 below. Uh, Helen Keeble's cosy cottage in Oak Bay, uh, where she looked after and fed her, her boys, and Mount Baker was full screen in the picture window uh, on, uh, of the cottage. Um, uh, we, <clears throat> um, we now know better than we did in those rose-tinted 60s. Um, Nicholas's friend, Brian Tassin, kindly got me a job at Yubo on the log booms of Lake Carichen. Um, uh, we were, in those days, we were moving virgin forest trees so big they had to be cut up in the water. And two years later, when I went back, the mill was down to matchsticks of second growth, and a couple of years later, it closed. The romance had turned to realism and an urgent need for good pastoral care. Nicholas brought that combination of romance, realism, and great care to his teaching. He would undoubtedly have endorsed the only realistic part of Michael Young's satire, a belief in the transformative power of education. Nicholas's uh, form of education was liberal, humanitarian and sporting, men's sana in corpore sano. On his visit back to England from university school and from here, uh, as you know, and as Noel has described, he often um, took a, a rugby team. Um, uh, and that, that was the source of more great stories. Um, including 
the appearance of armed guerrillas at the after party of a rugby match in Bilbao. Um, and um, one uh, very tiny incident that appealed to his slightly Dadaist sense of humor. Um, his tour bus with his team stopped to refuel in deepest Wales. The garage man was thrilled to be serving a rugby team. Um, and where did you come from, he asked. Vancouver Island, replied Nicholas. And the garage man looked totally nonplussed as he obviously had no idea where that was. And there was a long pause and he replied, well now, there's a fine outing for you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we might have been here for a, a tale of a, a bit of a Mr. Chips um, if Franda hadn't come along. Brentwood was his life and remained so, but she was a wonderful influence. She was his romance, his realism, and his pastoral care. She, Mark, David, and Jennifer, and later their children, gave him stability, family, love, home comfort, all the things that he idealized from his own life in early England, in early England, <laughs> his early life in England. Um, their house on Knipson Road was beautiful and welcoming, as you guys know. Um, and Frander's gentle, firm, and reassuring temperament is immortalized in my own family to this day, as we said to our kids, and our kids to say, that, say to their children, when the rough housing gets a bit too over the top, it'll end in tears. <laughs> uh, um, can I leave you with, to my mind, one of Nicholas's best stories? Um, from the time of our, this was from the time of our mother Jean's funeral in England. Uh, all four of us siblings were sitting together in my office when he casually said, I wonder what happened to those letters? And we all said, what letters? And he replied, why, the letters from Unity Mitford to Jean, written on Reichskanzlei headed notepaper all about her life as a Hitler groupie in 1930s Berlin. <laughs> you can imagine we all gasped. <laughs> we knew that Jean and Unity Mitford had been friends at school. In fact, they were both expelled. Um, um, and that Jean in school holidays had been to stay at the mad Mitford household with all those sisters. According to Nicholas, on a previous visit to England, he had been helping our mother move house when he found the letters in the attic. We looked everywhere, but as executives, we never found any trace of them. So either our mother destroyed them after Nicholas found them, or over to you. Good history or fake news? <laughs> Good stories, well told, inspiring others. It worked for me. And I, I judge by your turnout today that it worked for his students. That's how I would like to remember Nick. And to steal uh, some immortal words from, shamelessly steal some immortal words from one of his students, Wade Davis. He was a dream weaver. Howard Martin. When I came to Brentwood in 1969, Nick was a three-year veteran and very much one of the senior staff, as well as being housemaster of Ellis House. And I was one of seven new teachers, most of us from England, referred to as the Seven Dwarfs by Bill Ross. <laughs> I wasn't the smallest, though. He, t he told Nick, remember this, he told Nick to be careful not to step on us when he went into the staff room. <laughs> For the next 32 years, Nick and I were colleagues along with many other young people. Um, many of us were there for three decades, I guess. Um, several people we've lost, um, but others that are here could be doing this job for me too, telling us, telling us about uh, Nick relating their knowledge and understanding of this remarkable teacher. We all know how single-minded he was in his devotion to his subject history and to sharing that devotion with hundreds of students. But he was a hard taskmaster to anyone who did not meet his standards. 
my classroom for many years was immediately below uh, his <laughs> in the, uh, the old uh, classroom block that uh, was knocked down uh, in October, I think, last October. Um, <laughs> on a Monday morning, first class, I would often hear a raised voice that shook the window and the name of the student who hadn't completed the essay assignment over the weekend. Susan Holt, I do not accept lame excuses. Bring the completed essay to me, to my office, by five this afternoon. I hope you did that, Susan, because I know she's in the room. <laughs> and on an, another occasion, Nick directed his grade 10 class to build a set in the auditorium to reenact the uh, Battle of Vimy Ridge. All 20 students were to play a part in the action, but it was the Privet House boys who were designated to build the set during prep time. However, Albert Nickel, the prep duty master, forbade the boys to leave the house between seven and nine that evening, <laughs> and the set was not built. You can hear it coming, can't you? <laughs> Albert and I were sitting quietly in the staff room next morning when Nick burst in and screamed at Albert, waving his finger like this, you have sabotaged my class play. How dare you, he said. Albert's reply, and I can't remember the exact words, but it enraged Nick. And he grabbed him by the tie, <laughs> pressing him up. He's like this up against, <laughs> up against the window. Albert then said, uh, Howard, you see that I am not raising my hands or physically resisting. <laughs> that set Nick off into the biggest Nick fit that I ever saw. <laughs> Nick fit was a term that uh, Franda conjured up for occasions <laughs> like this. We've all been at the receiving end of a Nick fit, I'm sure. Uh, but the next day, he never held grudges. The next day, he was as nice as pie. Although, probably for Albert, it took 48 hours. <laughs> the same passion and drive were obvious in everything he undertook in the school. House mastering, rugby coaching, tennis countless overseas tours, university placement for graduating students, announcing at the Brentwood Regatta, acting as staff liaison in the Brentwood, uh, to the old Brentonian Association, and so on and so on. And then to cap it all off, when he retired in August 2001, he set about writing a history of Brentwood College from its beginning in 1923, uh, through to 2001, his retirement year. In less than 12 months, he had researched and written the book. Kindled from the Ashes was in print by October 2002. Retirement did not mean the end of his uh, teaching history. He threw himself into giving three-hour lectures for several years to the elder college, that is the over 50 students in the community. Among this new audience was Eric Qualley, who is here today, who, who he had taught at university school in last class, I think it was 1962, but they keep coming back. <laughs> his reputation in the valley as a superb lecturer was reflected in the fact that his classes were always oversubscribed and the local theatre was forever scrambling to move him into a, a larger room to cope with it. Every Saturday morning for the past 12, 13 years, I guess, uh, Nick and I met at the coffee shop and we discussed, as, as you would guess, history, mostly 20th century, or rather he taught me history. He was, the, <laughs> he was the professional and I the eager amateur. But I could never match his grasp of detail. It was incredible what he could remember, dates, people, places and so on in, his, in history. We also talked cricket, of course. As a schoolboy at Tunbridge, he'd been coached by, played with, or rubbed shoulders with at least, at least five cricketers who play for England. Colin Cowdery, Maurice Tate, John Dews, James Langridge, 
I think it's James rather than John Langridge. Correct me, Mr. Prowse? No? And Roger Priddo. I know Nick would have wanted me to mention these names at this gathering. He played at Lords, you know, the most famous cricket ground in the world. He played for Tunbridge School against Clifton College in 1954 and 1955. Uh, I am very envious. Had he been two years younger, he would have played against John Cleese of Monty Python <laughs> fame, who played for, was a good cricketer apparently, at uh, Clifton College in Bristol. With so much of his life and career spent at Brentwood, he obviously, we obviously talked about school events, his classes, individual students, his rugby teams and overseas tours. We recalled war memories of German planes and flying bombs, the V1s, V2s over the Sussex coast. And I learned a little bit more about two of his famous 19th century ancestors. One, a William Geoffrey Prowse, who was a poet and journalist who covered the Oxford-Cambridge boat race for the Daily Telegraph in the sort of mid-19th mid, uh, century. And he was a passionate follower of cricket too. The other, William Prowse, was captain of HMS Sirius at the Battle of Trafalgar. It was he who first raised the alarm that the enemy fleets were leaving port and sent word to Nelson. The sea battle began two days later. That uh, William Prowse um, served 55 years in the Royal Navy, ended his career as a rear admiral. So Nick has obviously inherited some powerful historical genes. <laughs> I can continue to learn more and more about Nicholas up to the, until the last year or so when he would say to me, Pinch, you always call me Pinch. I don't, I don't seem to have any energy these days. I'm getting a bit muddled up here. And the frustration was, was, was tough on him, I know. But before that time, he had given so much to so many. The numbers here at this memorial sort of bear witness to that. Um, I was going to finish there, but uh, this morning, just as a footnote, I uh, bumped into a fellow called Jim Wenman. Um, Jim Wenman's uh, father, Reg Wenman, was uh, deputy headmaster at university school when Nick went there in 1960, 60, 64. Um, uh, and Jim reminded me that uh, his father, Reg, had uh, picked Nick up at the ferry, uh, taken him up to his house in Gordon Head in Victoria to feed and uh, dine him before he started his teaching at uh, at um, university school. And then Jim, the son, one of the sons of Jim and John, uh, Jim recounted uh, a, a Nick fit moment <laughs> as a student in uh, sort of the mid uh, 1963, 64, I think he said it was. Um, however, Jim said that he would like me to say to this uh, gathering that how much staff, how much staff and students at university school respected this young Mr. Prowse. He was in his uh, mid-twenties then. Most of Nick's cricket played in Canada was for Incogs, the team made up of staff and old boys of the university school. Um, people, there were two, uh, I don't know if they're here, but uh, two uh, great friends, lifetime friends that he had, that he met at university school, Rob Wilson, and uh, Ian Muggeridge, two teachers at that school, both cricketers, of course, uh, and I'm not sure whether they, they may not be well enough to get here, but uh, I know they'll be thinking of him. Thank you. Duncan. You know, <laughs> Duncan and I have often seen each other. My name is Wade Davis, and I was a student of Nick's in the late 60s, early 70s. And Duncan and I have seen each other often in London, but I, I must confess I, I haven't met Noel, and I even had forgotten that Nick had a twin brother. So as I rushed into the hall today, the first thing I saw was Nick. So I was wondering, what am I doing here? Uh, 
you know, not long after I, I left Brentwood, I was living in Colombia, working as a botanical explorer, when I ran into this eccentric British journalist who had walked from the tip of South America, and he was walking to Alaska, and the only place where there was no tarmac was this notorious Darien Gap, 300 miles of swamp and rainforest that then separated Colombia from Panama. And so on a whim, he invited me to, hired me, in fact, to guide him through a place I had never been. Uh, and on top of everything, he had a stipulation with his newspaper that he wasn't allowed to take any form of transportation whatsoever. So even before we got to the opening to the gap, we had to traverse five days of the Cienega del Rio Trato, swamps up to the neck in the rainy season. And I always remember my professor at Harvard had said that uh, before I went to the Amazon, he always said, don't bother with uh, leather boots because all the snakes bite at the neck. So as I was walking through these swamps, making my way to a hut of a skin trader where that morning a rabid dog gave birth on my feet, I was contemplating this approach to the Darien. And a little old lady came up to me and said to me, you know, your hair's blonde, your eyes are blue. It's too bad everything will be yellow by the time you get to Panama. And thus the adventure began. We got um, chased by the military, uh, hoodwinked by various guides, eventually ended up escaping the clutches of the military and spending 12 days with three Kuna, Kuna Indians in the forest, utterly lost with no food and no shelter in the rainy season. And when finally I managed to find our way to the right of way, um, I came into the shadow of these arc lamps at the construction site, and they shut down construction. By this point, we were carrying one of the Indian lads who had wounded himself. And all of these engineers looked at me, who at that point had lost 30 pounds. I was 146 pounds. And they, they just couldn't believe that I was so upbeat and happy, having gone through that extraordinary physical ordeal. But of course, what none of them understood is that I had played rugby for Nick Proust. <laughs> Now, I came to Brentwood in grade 11, and I knew that the Colts rugby team was going on a tour to, to Britain, where I had never been. And I knew nothing about this game, except people seemed to run around the pitch and whack each other. Uh, but I wanted to make that team. And I remember at one point, I got a blister that became so infected that not only could I not walk, it had to be operated on. And I had two running through my entire foot to drain the pus. And that gave me about four days grace with Nick Prouse. And he suddenly came up to me and said, I notice you're walking. <laughs> yes. Well, that means you can play. I said, OK. And in the next scrimmage, one of the masters, I forget his name. I do remember his thighs that were like redwoods. And he somehow was playing against us. And I was a break. And I just decided to whack him. And I whacked him. And I just bounced off like a fly off a wall. But I heard these three words behind me, well done, Wade. And you suddenly realize that the reason you did everything for this man is because he made you feel like you're somebody. You know, he, 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 you can't imagine what he did for my life. You know, before I came to Brentwood, I was on a downward spiral. My grade point average at a fancy private school in Montreal had dropped by 10 percentage points for four years, and it wasn't looking good. But suddenly here at Brentwood, everything turned around. You know, I'm about to launch my 23rd book. Tomorrow I'll be with the Prime Minister, giving probably my 2,000th speech, and not one speech would have happened, not one book would have been written without the inspiration of people like Nick Proust, because it was only once I became a professor and a teacher that I realized that teaching really has very little to do with the transmission of knowledge. It's all about being a catalyst of dreams. That's why I always said that Nick was like a dream weaver. He made you feel that you were somebody. And the, the multiple lessons that came my way because of Nick and Gil Bunch, the, my two true inspirations at this college, really taught me that, for example, that creativity is a consequence of action, not its motivation. Nick and taught you that pessimism was an indulgence. Um, orthodoxy, the enemy of invention, despair, and insult to the imagination. He used to say that if you're not living on the edge when you're young, you're taking up too much space. 
And from Nick, I discovered that nature really does love courage. You need to do what needs to be done and only then ask whether it was possible or permissible. You jump off a cliff as a young man and you discover that you, in fact, land not on rocks but on a feather bed because the world actually exists to lift you up, not to beat you down. And because of the confidence that a man like Nick Prouse, inspired by his very um, example, oh, and by the way, we did, I did make that team. We did go to Scotland, and we won three games out of five. I just want to let you know. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how that quite happened. I don't know. Um, I know we put a few of those boys out of the game. That was something Nick hoped we would do. Um, <laughs> But this, this overwhelmed sense of confidence that I left Brentwood with, a confidence that allowed me to be patient and to give my destiny time to find me. You know, the greatest challenge in life, as we all know, um, is to be the architect of your own life. And if you can learn to have an inner compass so that you are actually making every decision that comes your way, you may not always make the right one, but if you own those decisions, you become the architect of your own life. And we all know that bitterness comes to those who look back on a long life of decisions imposed upon them by forces beyond their, um, their selves. The other thing I think I learned from Nick was not just the essence of storytelling, but in a sense the nature of winning and losing, of good and evil. You know, we have in the, in the Christian tradition a sort of sense that good will ultimately triumph over evil, and we always struggle that, but you know, it never happens. And Peter Matthewson, one of my favorite writers, said that, that anyone who thinks they can change the world is both wrong and dangerous. And he had in mind people like Hitler, Mao, and Stalin, but he also had this idea that, that we, 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 will, we will never triumph over evil, but we must put our shoulder to the wheel of righteousness. My father used to always say that there's a choice in life. What side are you going to be on? And the Christian tradition kind of gets stumped on that, but if you look into the Eastern traditions, they, they understand that. You know, when Lord Krishna, for example, was famously asked by a disciple the question that had provoked any number of heresies in Europe, if God is all-powerful, why does he tolerate evil in the universe? Lord Krishna said, to thicken the plot. And this is exactly what Nick taught, that you will never triumph over injustice but you have to spend all of your life on the right side of history. And only by that does the pendulum of history move to what is good, decent, and true. And it's those values that became etched in the spirit and soul of every student who ever entered a classroom with Nick Press. Thank you. easily intimidated. So I want to know who put this speaker list together because I'm following Wade Davis and I'm preceding Andrea Pennells. <laughs> two, two of the finest public speakers I know. Thanks, Bill. I bring, uh, before I start my comments, I, I bring some greetings from several people and organizations. Uh, greetings from the Couch and Rugby Club where Nick played. Greetings from Hans Goody, one of Canada's greatest rugby players who I spent an evening with a few days ago. Doug Sturrock, one of Nick's great rugby friends. Gary Duclo, former teacher here. BC Rugby and Rugby Canada all send their best wishes to Nick and his family. Well, I was a student here in the 1970s. There were two people that always got our attention. One was Gil, and the other was Nick, no surprise. And Nick in particular had this uncanny ability to get the attention of any bedraggled student who had strayed from his lofty expectations. And I've learned tonight, or this afternoon, excuse me, that those were called Nick fits. I didn't know that, it was wonderful. <laughs> Many of the young men in my particular class were once described by Jim Burroughs as cognitively, cognitively, excuse me, cognitively challenged Neanderthals. <laughs> and 
and we tested his patients and our teachers. But Nick's response to that was, great, we're going to have a good pack of forwards. <laughs> I fondly remember running down, literally running down the uh, old hallway of the old building, which acted like an incredible echo chamber uh, with several of my mates. I was in grade 10, and one of them had lost the plot with Nick. And we were about 15 or 20 meters past the, uh, the old staff room, and we heard Nick's bellow. One of the boys said, my God, the windows survived. <laughs> but this poor fellow paled. And of course, we started ducking for cover and giggling like mad because, first of all, it wasn't us. And secondly, um, the guy probably deserved it anyway. But that was the immediate impact that Nick could have. Secretly, we knew that he had a soft spot for all of us. And, and maybe even more of a soft spot for those Neanderthals that Jim had described. And of course, once the dust had settled, and this poor guy, I can't remember what he had to do, but he, he, he was in big trouble. But the, the, the pure joy we had was imitating Nick in the dorms later. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of fun. And a few of the guys, just could, he could, they could get Nick just perfectly. Wade already talked about how immensely talented and passionate Nick was as a teacher. And I became a history teacher because of Nick. He had this uncanny ability to make Canadian history interesting. And back in grade 10 when I was going to school, it was pretty boring. But he regaled us of stories of the Battle of Batoche. He had a great admiration for Louis Riel and of course his trench warfare stories were legendary. And as he was teaching us, he was also teaching us some really important social justice and life lessons that I'm sure have stayed with many of us. Of course, several generations of rugby players were indelibly influenced by Nick, of course, and Ivor Ford, or as the tight head prop on my rugby team in grade 12, a fellow named Rick Joubert, who became a doctor, tight head prop doctor, pretty, pretty impressive, described them as Attila the Hun and Winston Churchill. <laughs> Try and pick which was Attila the Hun. As a coach, Nick was intense and expressive. If you don't come up together on defense, Shawnigan is going to scythe through you. Ivor. Laconic, well done, forwards. <laughs> Nick, if you don't pressure the inside three, it will be a bloodbath. Ivor, well done, forwards. <laughs> Nick was the quiet taskmaster, but there was no doubt, sorry, Ivor was the uh, quiet taskmaster. There's no doubt, however, that Nick was the motivator. And anyone who played for these two gentlemen were prepared to absolutely gut themselves on the rugby field. It was one of Nick's gifts of many. It was clear that while Nick loved to win, and he instilled a winning attitude in all of us, what he was far more interested in pulling from us was a maximum effort and being unselfish players. Again, important life lessons. Over the December break in 1976, Nick and I were took the first and second 15 on a tour to Britain, and we had to have extra practices up at Beefield. So imagine this, it's, it's a miserable day in the middle of December. It's four o'clock when we started practice because of exams, so it was already getting dark. It was raining, in fact it was sleeting. There was ice on the field. It was cold, but as Nick would, as he always did, he would run the practice, and Nick did not run short practices. So at about 6.20, he was admonishing us for dropping the ball. Stop dropping the bloody ball, to which one of our players, rather cheeky uh, fullback, said, uh, you can't catch, you can't uh, catch what you can't see. <laughs> And then, of course, dead, dead silence. Dead silence. And we were waiting for what I now know is a Nick fit. <laughs> but he could laugh at himself. And he went, McDougal, 
Good point. <laughs> Session over, carry on. The tour was memorable, and in the midst of the tour, we had a night uh, in a hotel in Stratford on Avon on our way up to uh, the north. And we were given the night to spend in the town with a hard curfew of 10 p.m. I think Nick and I ever had some friends locally, and I think they probably went to a pub. We didn't run into them, but I'm sure they went to a pub. <laughs> Needless to say, we participated in the local English culture wholeheartedly, and miraculously, we all made it back by the, uh, the 10 o'clock curfew. However, at 11.15, there was this knock on my door. And so I pulled myself out of bed, I opened the door, and there was Nick standing in between two pretty big constable, police constables. And he said, Felix, somebody has stolen the flag out of the town square. And I'm expecting you to get it back, because if you don't, I am spending the night in jail. So I thought that was quite funny. Um, and, uh, but I was tasked with finding the, uh, the, uh, the cretin that had stolen it. So I found him, and he said, listen, I'll give it back to you, but Mayor, let, that was my nickname, Mayor, let's do this. Ask the cops to give you an hour. And maybe he, they'll actually throw him in jail for that hour. <laughs> and, and if they do, I'll go with you, we'll pick him up, and I'll bring my camera and we can take a shot of him. What do you think? Uh, Nick, Nick was not impressed. <laughs> and we got the flag back, unfortunately. Um, just in closing, Nick, Nick was everything that a boarding school teacher needs to be. He was an excellent teacher who loved his students, and not just the most able. He worked as patiently and as methodically and as thoroughly with those less talented with the same passion and determination as those to whom studying came far more easily. Simply because, above all, he believed in developing good people with great values. He was an excellent housemaster. This is an Alice House tie. And, and, and also a real fan of symbolism. The other bit of symbolism I have from Nick is a arthritic hip because I love rugby so much I played too long. He had a wonderful sense of humor, especially when you got to know him. He was able to pull the best out of his rugby teams, and he was able to pull the best out of his students. He was supported by Franda and laterally by Maritza. He was a dedicated family man. His passion was balanced by deep care for his students and his family. He was a Brentwood pioneer, and he will always be a Brentwood icon. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> David, Mark, and Jennifer must be thinking of their beloved mother, Franda, today. As I think of mine, Marisa of hers, and Nick's brothers of theirs. Our mothers may be, as is Nick, although all our hearts stopped when we saw Noel again. They may be beyond our physical reach, but we hold them fast and always in our hearts. I remember Nick talking to me about his mother, Jean, who had been friends, and he told me the story, with the infamous Mitford sisters of Hitler Association. And just to finish that story, Nick told me when he came back from his mother's funeral that his mother had told him as a historian that she was going to destroy those letters so they would not appear in a history book or the Daily Mail sometime in the future. But Nick always also talked about his father, Kedrick, whose ancestors, as you've heard a little, traced their lineage back to Royal Navy sea captains, one who sailed with Drake against the Spanish Armada, 
another with Nelson against the French at Trafalgar in the Napoleonic Wars. Little wonder then that the young Nicholas Robin Barrington Prowse acquired an interest in history. First at home in Lewis with its Norman castle, medieval priory, and the Tudor townhouse of Anne of Cleves, the fourth wife of Henry VIII. Then at school in Tunbridge, with its playing fields and ivy towers, and on to university in Cambridge at Gonville and Keys, his father's college, celebrated in the Oscar-winning movie Chariots of Fire. Quintessential England. Afternoon tea and cricket on the lawn. In days of yore, younger sons of prominent families like Nick's, the spares to the heirs, often set sail for foreign parts to seek their fortune, Spanish conquistadors, French coureurs de bois, Scottish adventurers, English colonials. Nick charted his own course from England's green and pleasant land, exploring, as you've heard, the Canadian wilderness before settling in the Couch and Valley, as English longstockings had done in pioneering years past. In 1966, Brentwood College, refounded in 1961 in Mill Bay, became Nick's new home. Ellis House, then located at the top of the old solarium building, his domain. Ivor Ford recalled that Nick the housemaster made Attila the Hun seem as benevolent as Peter Pan. <laughs> when my husband Jerry and I arrived at Brentwood in 1982, Ivor told us that Nick had mellowed. But I remember one winter morning when Nick, now living off campus with Franda and their family on the couch and estuary, had dug his car deep out of the snow on their steep driveway to arrive on time for an 8.15 a.m. faculty meeting which Headmaster Bill Ross had already wisely cancelled but it seemed that no one had phoned Nick. Having tramped through the snow only from Mackenzie House on campus, Jerry and I watched in stunned silence as an incandescent Nick pursued Bill through the old sunroom, down the hallway to the headmaster's study ranting at the injustice of his no good, very bad, horrible day. <laughs> Bill had the wit to close his door, Jerry and I the wit to escape unscathed from one of many knit fits that we experienced. But by then, as you've heard from Wade and Marius, Nick was a Brentwood powerhouse. I list his multiple roles in my foreword to his Kindled from the Ashes, his history of Brentwood College from 1923 to 2001. Thanks to his exhaustive research, his own recall of 35 years of Brentwood's history, and his training as a historian, you can learn a lot about our school by reading it. On page 96, for example, Nick records an encounter in 1987. Bill Ross had just appointed me as head of the English department in order to lead major curriculum change. Chairing our first meeting, I faced one of Brentwood's formidable all-male preserves. T. Gilbunch, Ira Ford, Victor Laroni, Nick Prowse. None of them wanted curriculum change, by the way. <laughs> I confess then, and Nick quoted me, that I felt like Ophelia, a green girl unsifted in such perilous circumstance. And we all know what happened to Ophelia in Hamlet. 
Yet, it was in their enlightened, erudite, witty, unfailingly supportive company that I had some of my happiest years at Brentwood. Nick and I shared a special bond. Unlike Gil and Ivor, we were both historians who had minored in English at university. What impressed me most about Nick, however, was his passion for an encyclopedic knowledge of Canadian history, a subject as an Englishman he must essentially have taught himself. Jerry and I feel fortunate that our sons learned the history of their parents' adopted country from Mr. Prowse. Captivated by his passionate teaching, Tom, a scientist, made a point of visiting Vimy Ridge, Beaumont Hamel, and Juneau Beach in his travels in Europe. Andrew graduated with a degree in history, like Marius. Both quote Nick verbatim. At a party, Andrew, who's an actor as well, had Nick himself in fits of laughter with his pitch-perfect imitation of his master teacher. And yes, Nick could laugh at himself. Perceptively, Tom compared Nick to Bing of Vimy, the quintessentially English general appointed in 1916 to command the Canadian Corps. Bing's leadership and reforms, including the appointment of Canadians as staff officers, contributed significantly to the Canadian victory in 1917 at the Battle of Vimy Ridge, which historians, including Nick, deemed Canada's coming of age as a nation on the world stage. The Canadian troops at Vimy nicknamed themselves the Bing Boys. In similar fashion, Nick, an Englishman too, inspired generations of Brentwood boys and girls as he honoured and elevated the teaching of Canadian history in class and at legendary Remembrance Day assemblies. Nick commanded our attention, my son Tom concluded, and we remember everything he said. Like Bing of Vimy, Nick's influence reached far beyond the battlefield and the classroom. On my appointment as head of school in 2000, I named Nick our senior master. And on his retirement, I recommended Nick's recognition by the Brentwood Board of Governors for the rarely given Hugh Stephen Award for his outstanding service to our school. As Brentwood's first unofficial revisionist historian, I wrote in 2001, an English dilettante Nick was not. What is apparent to the faculty and the students is Nick's uncompromising passion for excellence and his tremendous capacity and drive to help shape the very character of this school itself. For 35 years in the midst of the formidable challenges faced by a young school, especially in the turbulent 1960s and 1970s, Nick played a critical role in Brentwood's very survival and unique development. As an academic, an athlete, and an avid supporter of the arts, Nick embodied Brentwood's tripartite philosophy. As a housemaster, he lived Brentwood's residential ethos. As a teacher, a coach, and senior academic advisor, he inspired generations of Brentonians who were fortunate to experience history or rugby or university counselling with Prowse. Having written the story of the great men who gave life to the emblematic flame of Brentwood's history, I wrote to the board, Nick may have downplayed his own vital role. So let history record Nicholas R.B. Prowse as one of Brentwood's great men, a true guardian of the flame, a Brentwood hero. 
Master teacher, inspiring colleague, valued mentor, and dear friend. Nick taught me, my family, our students, and our school what it is to be Canadian. As a historian, he also emphasized how important it is for us all as Brentonians and as citizens meticulously to research the facts in order to honor and document our past and make significant decisions for the future. For this and for his enduring friendship over many decades, I am forever thankful. I began with mothers, I close with wives. Across an ocean and a continent from England's sceptered isle, Nick put down his Canadian roots here in the Couch and Valley with Franda. Then grieving her untimely death, he found solace and new love with Marisa. Franda's and then Marisa's love nurtured and grounded Nick, supporting him to go forth and share his extraordinary gift as a storyteller. Yes, Wade, a dream weaver with generations of Brentonians. Nick wrote this card for Jerry and me one anniversary, but the words speak today to Nick's own love for Franda and Marisa, who loved and cherished him in return. The joys of marriage are the heaven on earth. Love took up the glass of time and turned it in his glowing hands Every moment, lightly shaken, ran itself in golden sands. Thank you, dearest Nick, for sharing the glass of time with us all. We will always remember you as we hold you fast forever in our hearts. Thank you. I have been asked to speak uh, about Nick's life after he retired from his storied career at Brentwood. But before I do, to provide a little context, humor me while I take a quick leap backwards. I came to Brentwood in the spring of 1999, just two years before Nick retired, as a part-time staff member hired to support the fundraising efforts of the then headmaster, Bill Ross, and to develop the school's alumni database. With limited office space in the Ross Center, I was allocated a small desk in a corner of Nick's office. I can recall feeling extremely embarrassed that a seasoned and accomplished Brentwood pioneer such as Nick would suddenly be required to share an office with the likes of me. However, Nick very quickly made me feel extremely welcome. He swept me up into his world, sharing school history and alumni stories and never missing an opportunity to involve me in all things related to alumni. In those early days, he was my lifeline as I found my feet in this special community. I will always be grateful to him for that warm welcome. After Nick retired from Brentwood, well, he didn't retire. His boundless energy and enthusiasm for serving and honoring Brentwood alumni <clears throat> were steadfast and infectious. Named by past head of school, Andrea Pennells, as Brentwood's historian, one of the first projects he took on at her encouragement, and as you've heard, was fittingly to write a book about the school's history. Many of you will have seen her read this book, Kindled from the Ashes. He worked on it tirelessly for months, researching the history of the original school, interviewing faculty, alumni, and staff, and editing over and over again with his eagle eye. It was a labor of love, capturing important details in Brentwood's past that may otherwise have been lost and it will remain an important resource for the school for many years to come. With this epic project done, Nick energetically appeared in my office with that twinkle in his eye and a story or two, and then asked how else he could be of service. It didn't take long before he agreed to take on the mountainous task of going through dozens of boxes of photographs from the school archives and using his incredible memory to, lame, to name literally hundreds of people. He would come in once or twice 
for several hours, tw once or twice a week for several hours to review people and events in the pictures, seek out other longtime teachers to help identify faces he wasn't sure about, and then record them for posterity. As you can imagine, there were many stories to go along with those photos. I was stunned when he appeared one day and said he had completed all of the boxes, meaning labeling school photos from 1961 to 2000. In the following years, I referred to his notes on these photos, written in his unmistakable handwriting, again and again, and I've no doubt the current staff continues to rely on them. Nick also helped by contributing a regular column, Pioneer's Perspective in the Brentonian Magazine, researching and finalizing the details for the school's International Athletes Board, and researching and writing complete biographies of all of Brentwood's headmasters and pioneer teachers, again capturing, capturing valuable historical school information for posterity. In addition to these major contributions and so many others not mentioned here, his Brentwood connections thrived. Post-retirement, not surprisingly, many of you, his former Brentwood students and colleagues, continued to stay in touch with Nick. He always drew a crowd of alumni when he attended reunions and regional gatherings. Even after he stopped attending these events, many old Brentonians, faculty and staff, continued to correspond with him, visit one-on-one, -on -one, and to gather in smaller groups over coffee. He deeply cherished these ongoing points of contact and hearing about your post-Brentwood adventures. His life after Brentwood, of course, included much more than his ongoing ties to the school. With a busy social life, travel, a long reading list, and of course there were cricket matches to be watched. He and Franda moved to the Inner Harbour in Victoria shortly after his retirement where they enjoyed several years living in the big city, uh, overlooking the ocean and soaking up the urban experience. Among other things, during that time Nick served as a keen volunteer at the Maritime Museum in Bastion Square, where visitors benefited from his love of people and his love of history. Ultimately, Nick and Franda returned to Cowichan Bay where they had enjoyed so many years together and purchased a beautiful home overlooking the ocean. Incidentally, there was a lineup of buyers for the house, but his relationship with a former Brentwood student ensured that he and Franda got the house. They enjoyed being close to their kids and grandkids, and when his beloved Franda became, Franda became gravely ill, it was a blessing that they were in this community surrounded by family and friends during that very difficult time. Their return to the Cowichan Valley prompted Nick to once again contribute to the community, starting with tutoring local post-secondary students. He then had the idea that he could make a contribution by teaching history classes at the local Elder College. And boy, did he ever. From 2007 until 2015, every one of his classes was full. In fact, the program director told me they were not only full, but waitlisted. She also confessed he was one of her favorite teachers in the program. He was always so friendly. He had a loyal following of Elder College students who never missed his lecture, but one of his most cherished sessions was when in 2014, five grads from Brentwood's class of 1976, together with one of his former SMU students, registered for his class. And for a nostalgic test, four of them showed up wearing Brentwood blazers. <laughs> in true Nick form, his classes were more than just a presentation of historical facts. He created stories woven from his intelligent analysis drawn on his breadth of knowledge of world history with compelling titles like Canadian History, 15 Who Made a Difference, The Thrice Promised State, Palestine, 1917 to 1993, Fateful Choices of the 20th Century, and Small Wars in Faraway Places That Made Our World, 1945 to 1974. I was lucky because he could usually be persuaded to share a mini lecture with me over lunch in the weeks leading up to one of those classes. Nick could truly make history come to life. Nick used to joke that because he was a twin, from early on, he never liked to be alone. Companionship was very important to him. Thinking back, perhaps that's why he was so accommodating when I was plunked in his office all those years ago. Happily, along came his second wife, Maritza, and how very grateful he was for her company, her kindness, her love, and her steadfast care. More than a decade after Nick's retirement, alumni continued to revere him and to acknowledge his impact on their lives. <clears throat> For example, in 2013, he was deeply touched when Duane Van Ewen, class of 1973, established a bursary fund at Brentwood in Nick's name, paying tribute to his former teacher and coach, 
for his support and guidance, while also helping a new generation of students gain access to the same kind of opportunity. Then, in September 2015, Rob Dixon, class of 1994, initiated a dinner in Nick's honour. More than 100 were in attendance, and many more wrote to say they wished they could attend, with representation from all the decades in which Nick taught at Brentwood. Speeches and stories highlighted the tremendous influence Nick had on so many young people. It was a night which meant a lot to Nick. In his own words, quote, to be surrounded by so many former students who made my teaching career so special to me was a true privilege and an honor. I am not sure how true the many stories were, but they lifted my heart and brought back many happy memories in the classroom and on the sports field. Accepting his failing health was a challenge for Nick. He was annoyed that he couldn't remember the, remember the facts that he used to recall with ease. But he, of course, continued to be gracious in spite of his health issues, and he was always so pleased when people came to visit. The last time I visited Nick in the hospital, one of the things he and Maritza made a point of mentioning was how much it would mean for him if Wade Davis could speak at his celebration of life. Nick was very fond of you. This would have meant so much to him. There is no easy way to say goodbye to cherished friends and family. Nick will be forever etched in our memories and our hearts, and the many contributions he made to Brentwood and its students will also never be forgotten. Simply put, our historian himself now becomes an important part of history in our treasured personal and collective stories. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. People know, some people know who I am and some people don't know. I am Marisa Prouse, Nicola's wife. Forget, it's all right. First of all, I would like to thank Brentwood family who organized this event for Nicholas. And I would like to thank his former colleagues and, for, and former students to come far away just to be with him today. Thank you very much. All I can say is Nicholas is a wa wonderful man, and I, and I love him, and I'm going to miss him. Thank you. So in closing, uh, thank you to everybody who's been here today, and in particular, all of the speakers that have spoken so fondly and eloquently about Nick. Uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful man. There is a uh, light refreshment uh, reception in Crooks Hall, which is to my right and your left of this building, and follow some of the veterans down, and we look forward to seeing you there. I'd also like to thank the school as well, uh, and in particular, uh, David and Bill Ross, who had a, a leading hand in getting the day right, and I think we've done that. So thank you very much for being here, and we'll see you down below. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you.